people don't know exactly how Custer was killed, but they do say the Buffalo calf woman was the person who knocks Custer from his horse. Welcome to Talk With History. I am your host, Scott, here with my wife and historian, Jen. Hello. On this podcast, we give you insights into our history-inspired world travels, YouTube channel journey, and examine history through deeper conversations with the curious, the explorers, and the history lovers out there. Before we talk about what I think is going to be a pretty fun topic tonight, always appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts, some stars on Spotify, wherever you're listening. It really does help us grow. And I don't think the History Channel has been over at Little Bighorn anytime recently. So <laughs> you're welcome to anyone who's listening. Help us out, give us a review, and, and let's get this podcast out to more folks. I want you to picture the sun hanging low on the horizon, casting a warm summer glow over the vast expanse of the Great Plains. Tense stillness in the air, broken only by the distant echoes of hooves and the soft rustling of prairie grass. In the heart of this sprawling landscape, two worlds stood poised to collide, one driven by a fierce desire to push supposed intruders back to lands they didn't desire. In other, bound by a fierce determination to defend their ancestry and way of life. The Battle of Little Bighorn loomed on the horizon, an impending clash of warriors and cultures that would forever etch its name into the annals of history. So, Jen, we got to visit Little Bighorn all the way up in Montana, where my family is from. <laughs> Let's talk about Little Bighorn and Custer's Last Stand. So... This area gets like three different names. So let's make sure we're hitting all the names. Like, yes. So it's it's the Battle of Little Bighorn. The The American Indians know it as the Battle of Greasy Grass. And it also has become kind of synonymous in American history as Custer's Last Stand. Yeah. So it's kind of these, all three of these events is the same event. Yeah, and it's partly because Custer became relatively well known during the American Civil War. And really, I think this battle kind of brought his fame about the most, which is why it kind of, there's those three names with it. Yeah, I mean, so a great death lives in infamy, right? And I don't think if Custer would have died, he would have been as famous today if he had lived. Yeah. So I think it's this battle. It's this last great victory of the American Indians. It's this basically this face off between you can think of it as uh, the West meets the natives, this meeting of these two. It's these clash of clash of cultures, cultures, exactly, who are meeting and then the, the culture that you don't think will win the one that hasn't you know, doesn't have the advanced technology is the one that is victorious. I mean, it's kind of your classic underdog story, mm -hmm. right? It's exactly. it's the, the big kid on the block comes through assuming that they can just kind of do whatever they want. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden they get punched right in the mouth. Yeah. You know, and then that's what happens. So set the stage for where we're at, maybe how we got out there and kind of what what was going on at that time? Sure. So this is um, 1876. So let's think about 10 years after the Civil War. This is where Custer has made his name. He was integral during the surrender. And we've talked about him before. And so he's been in the army now for a while, right? He's, he's gone through the Civil War. He's seen some battle. He's survived. He's victorious on the Union side. And now he's part of this Indian campaign. Basically, that's what they call it. Moving towards the West to, to basically get land for people who are ready to do Western expansions, for settlers, Oregon Trail. This is all this time. This is the time right after the Civil War where people are homesteading, moving out. And with the American Indians on the land... And their idea of land is not so much property and ownership. It's just to live off of. The Western culture is looking to put them on certain areas for them to stay because there's just encroachment and a lot of hostility between white settlers and the American Indians. Yeah. And if 
if you watch our video, one of the things I put in the beginning was like a timeline, Mm -hmm. right? You know, kind of to kind of give people a picture of what was going on. And and one of the things that I tried to stress and point out was there was the Treaty of Fort Laramie that had happened a few years prior. That's was is that correct? Oh yeah, that's correct. Yeah. But it happened in eighteen sixty eight. Eighteen sixty eight. So not even ten years. Yes, yeah, so not not even ten years. And then really, what what happened, and and you can kind of go into more details was in the Black Hills. And if you think Black Hills, think Mount Rushmore mm-hmm. in that area. Mm-hmm. People found gold. The white settlers started coming in and pushing the Indians out. And yep. then you just were like, hey, this is our land. You guys just gave this to us like, like a little while ago. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good Cliff Notes version yeah, of Scott. Yeah. So let, let's just explain a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So Fort Laramie is a spot on the Oregon Trail. It is a army base. It is a location where as people are coming out and settling, they're talking about, we're coming across American Indians. They're killing us. We are having hostilities with them. What can you do about this? Okay, let's go out, the army, the cavalry there at Fort Laramie, let's go out and kind of get these people together in their tribes and put them in places where they will be safe for themselves and also the Americans, the white settlers will be safe coming out. So the Treaty of Fort Laramie is these leaders of these tribes have come to Fort Laramie in 1868 and had agreed upon certain areas that they will stay. And like you mentioned, the Lakota Sioux have agreed to the Black Hills area as their reservation. And then you get the Crow who have agreed upon the Little Bighorn area, and that's named after a river there. And the river for basically Westerners is Little Bighorn. The river for the American Indian is Greasy Grass, and that's why that battle is called that. That that has been agreed upon as Crow Reservation, and so this is all decided upon in the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1868. So then, like you had said, 1874, gold is discovered in the Black Hills, and the Lakota Sioux are living there this is their land well all these westerners come in to make their fortunes and we talked about wild bill hickok coming in to do that yeah deadwood and deadwood and custer is supposed to be enforcing this treaty and he's not he's letting the people come in also custer wants to make his fortune too so the lakota sioux are mad because this is our land and now almost all of it has been taken. No one's enforcing this treaty. They they definitely enforce the treaty to keep us on the reservation, but they sure as heck aren't enforcing the treaty to keep the white settlers off of our land. So we're just going to move west. And as they move west, they move into the Crow Reservation. And so I, I want to start like this understanding that the Lakota Sioux and Cheyenne have kind of encroached on the Crow Reservation. And so the Crow people, they kind of want to be left alone. Yeah, I mean, it, it, if you think about it nowadays, right? I, I was trying to kind of picture this. It'd be like, you know, taking all of New York and the New Yorkers and mm-hmm. plopping them in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Like, they're, everybody's Americans, but all the, the, the Chicagoans are going to be like, what are you doing here, yes. New Yorkers? Like, you guys shouldn't be here. Yes. So there's conflict. So there's conflict. So at the beginning of 1876, America government has renegotiated the reservation area because of the gold in the Black Hills. And they've told Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, who are the two leaders of the Lakota Sioux, to come and let's renegotiate your reservations and we'll break up this large reservation of the Black Hills into six smaller reservations. But they don't show up. They don't come. They're like, no, this is wrong. We've already agreed to the Treaty of Fort Laramie and we're just going to move with our people to where good hunting is. And that was in along the river of Greasy Grass. Yeah, that's right. A, a good you, antelope you, herd. Yeah, you mentioned like there was a large yes. antelope herd. And so... Then they don't show up in the beginning of, of 1876. This is the army's job now to go find them and bring them back. Now, yeah. they've broken this large reservation up into six smaller ones. And we've talked about Standing Rock is one of those. So we know that one today. That's one of the six that they've broken up okay. into the South Dakota area. So when you think of South Dakota area, that's the Lakota Sioux area. And then we got the Crow Reservation over in Montana. And just to kind of paint the picture for those listening, right? We we spent, you know, a couple weeks, you mm-hmm. know, out kind of driving that whole area. We were all through Colorado and South Dakota. We, we did Little Bighorn, so the southern part of Montana. 
and there they are relatively different landscapes across mm-hmm. all of them like the black hills it, it's it's gorgeous area it's wooded it's hilly it's i mean it's really really nice it's mountainous it's very it's much more mountainous mm-hmm. than than i kind of initially had thought mm-hmm. like, not having spent a ton of time out there so if you're listening you know, think about these these native americans who are living in the black hills and get pushed out think Deadwood and, and the mm-hmm. kind of little bit of a gold rush before the true kind of 49er gold rush. And then all of a sudden they're moving out to a much more plains, like Great Plains type mm-hmm. area. So Little Bighorn in the southern Montana is not these massive mountains that are looming right there, mm-hmm. right? You're along a river, a little more like think Great Plains. That, yes. That's kind of a little bit more what it's, what it's like. So just to kind of paint the picture for those listening, there were multiple different Native Americans from multiple different areas just used to different things and they're out there just kind of trying to find a place where you know the white settlers will let them live yes. I mean I can imagine how incredibly frustrating and angry they could have been absolutely and they've kind of joined joined with the Cheyenne and they've joined with the Arapaho so you think it's Lakota Sioux the Dakota Sioux this it's kind of a breakdown of uh, the Sioux tribe is broken down it's broken into three separate and then you got the Cheyenne, the Northern Cheyenne, and the Arapaho. And they're all kind of encroaching in the Crow territory. And so the Crow asks for the army's help. And so you get, again, these little skirmishes that kind of start. You got the Battle of Rosebud that happens in June uh, 17th of 1876. And then you're going to get Battle of, Big, Battle of Little Bighorn in, on June 25th. So uh, not uh, even. Yeah, about a week. Ten days later, Yeah. yeah. And so you get these uh, army generals who are like, let's all go get them together. But they just can't seem to get on the same page. So for Rosebud, you get a, a guy who comes out, Cook, who is coming from the south area. And he hits a bunch of Lakota Cheyenne. And they just push him back. Yeah. And again, this kind of like probably reinforces them for the Bighorn. Yeah, right? it kind of gets, it gives them the confidence. Gives them the confidence. And I talk about Buffalo Calf Woman because she is integral in both battles. Battle of Rosebud for the Cheyenne is called Battle Where the Girl Saves Her Brother. And we get a lot of this oral American Indian history, and especially it's important in the Battle of Little Bighorn, but Battle of Rosebud, she rides out and saves her brother. Her brother is called Comes in Sight, and Comes in Sight has his horse shot from underneath him, and she rides out and and he runs and she grabs him and puts him on the horse and people kind of stop and watch this happening because it's not customary in the western culture at the time for women to fight like this and here's a woman who it's just very natural for her to go out and help her brother yeah we, we, we talk about that in the video and it's and again I, I always encourage folks to go watch the video that the link will be in the show notes but to you you watch our video and we take a lot of extra b-roll shots to kind of get these wide expansive shots of the plains and kind of what we're looking above down on the river so you can kind of get a feel for what some of these battles the setting for them yeah it's in a different it's a different type of fighting to think of all these army personnel from the civil war and they're used to this very front on front fighting where the American Indian is very much a warrior. It's going to ride circle. They're going to ride circles around you. They're going to hold on to their horses. Next, they're going to be hard to aim at. They're, they're, they really like to get the dust up to kind of get it kind of so you're confused. And it's a different type of fighting for them. They fire arrows into the sky, hoping that they just hit you. And so Cook just backs off. So Custer's kind of feeling like all these generals are coming to help me. But Cook just left. And he's and Custer's still a lieutenant colonel at the still time. Still a lieutenant colonel at the yeah. time. So he starts to head out. And he has these scouts, these Crow scouts with him who are like, they're over there. Well, the Crow scouts tell him they saw you coming. So they're probably going to fight you. And that's one of the reasons why Custer engages with them. Oh, so that's why he starts splitting his mm-hmm. kind of battalions off. Yes, or he probably would have just stayed put and waited for more reinforcements. Oh, interesting. But because the scouts have told him that they've seen us and they're going to come attack us, Custer's like, well, I should get the uh, offensive. I should attack first. And so on uh, the morning of June 25th, 1876, he rides out with his seven cavalry. It's about 400 men and starts to split them up. And... What he doesn't realize is this encampment 
of Dakota Sioux and Arapaho and Cheyenne, and Cheyenne are about 7,000 strong, 2,000 warriors strong. Wow. So you got 5,000 women, children, elders, chiefs, right? Sitting Bull is a part of them. Crazy Horse is a part of them. They're both there. Yeah. And if, and if you... Well, you, we should, we try. I, I tried really, really hard to kind of really paint the picture of what it must have looked like back then, because that area, while it's very kind of looks very kind of grassy mm-hmm. now, there was it was actually one of the the park rangers told us it was a lot more bushy mm-hmm. back then, a lot of kind of bigger bushes, so more difficult to see. But also, they're up higher on these ridges, looking kind of what further away at Little Bighorn River, which is kind of down, mm-hmm. almost over like a bluff. So it would be difficult. And there's like trees that are down by the yes. river. And so all, there's all these encampments down there. But it would still be difficult to see how and gauge how many were down there. Exactly. And if you see in our video, I'm pointing to where the green, green trees are because the green, green trees align the river. And the encampment is on the western side of that. So it's on the other side of the river. So as Custer comes in and he splits his men... Now, I want this perfectly clear before I move for any further. There, Nobody survives with Custer. So there is no primary source, firsthand documentation about what Custer was thinking, why he did what he did, because there's no survivors to tell you. All you we have is what people heard, what Reno's group heard, which they were almost a mile away. And then you have the oral history from the American Indian. And Reno, so he was with the original 400 before they split off. Mm-hmm. Then they split off into three groups. Reno was kind of- In the front. Off, kind of in the front, closer to the river, mm-hmm. and, and Custer was higher up on the ridge. Yes. So people feel, because Custer was very much a student of Sherman and Sherman's march to the sea, that he wanted to do kind of like, he was gonna bombard the front and have the warriors come at the front, which is what Reno was supposed to do. And then all the women and children would run to the rear and Custer was gonna go to the rear and capture the women and children. And having women and children as prisoners would cause the warriors to surrender. And then they would be able to get them to move back to their reservations in South Dakota. That, That's what people have historians and Put together. Put together as what, what the what, plan what was. What makes the most logical sense of what he was thinking. But it doesn't quite work because Custer really makes himself a small group. It's only 40 men who are killed on Custer's last stand. And that doesn't quite seem like you would put yourself in that small of a sit. But who knows? So Reno takes about 200 and hits the front. And again, 200 against 2,000 warriors is there they don't make it far at all they are pushed back and reno i mean they're fighting for their lives the the american indians fight in a way that they really try to get your horses to run and they really try to scare you scare the horses and get the horses to stampede and get out of the way because they know if a horse runs a lot of your supplies go with it and so you're only left with what you have and Custer did not bring any gapling guns he did not bring any quick shoot uh, shooting revolver um, rifles yeah and the american indians did have quick shooting rifles oh interesting so reno gets pushed back right away unbeknownst to custer who has already split off and gone around the i would say the eastern edge the northern edge and as he's coming around he splits up another group calhoun's group he splits them off down a small ravine Going down towards the river. From going the down ridge. towards the river. I would say hitting like the midpoint of the village. Yeah. So if you're kind of thinking of this in your head and you're listening, you know, pick, picture a TV screen in your head. Mm-hmm. At the top of the TV screen, kind of is where the ridge would be, and the bottom of the TV screen is where the the river would be. So Reno's coming down towards the river earliest, mm-hmm. right in the TV screen, and then towards that top middle, that's where Calhoun starts coming down. Yes, I think and Custer's trying to go C- around the back. Cust- Custer's trying to go around the entire top of the TV screen and mm-hmm. around the back. Yeah, and never gets there. He never gets there. He thinks he's going to get all the women and children, right? Well, Reno's group is hit by these warriors so quick, and the um, warriors see the men going across the top, and so they just go out after them. They, they keep a couple of guys still fighting Reno's group, but they go out after Calhoun's group and then they go right for Custer's group. And I'm talking about 
crazy horse. Yeah. I'm talking about the leader of the leader going out. And I talk about this in the video because crazy horse rides in between Calhoun and Custer's group. And both of them are trying to fire at this American Indian leader warrior and none of he's not being hit. And so it's very inspirational. Again, this is oral American Indian history, but this is very inspirational for the warriors to see him not only taking the lead, but not getting hit. And he's he's just in a very like war war fighting, you know, mode. S- yeah, stage, yeah, right? Sure. And so they're so inspired by him. So they have what they call the suicide boys, which are like these young warriors who jump from their horses and just charge. Custer they did, they just kind of follow Crazy yeah. Horse up there and like, we're doing this. It was, we're doing this. And so what's very interesting is Custer, he has really, he's paralyzed himself to 40 men. And he's with his brother. He's with his nephew. And he has really gotten to a point where they are encircled. Yeah, they, they're probably at the highest kind of point. Of they try the to get the high ground. They yeah. try to get the high ground. So and, the, and they were, but they were... You know, looking at, and again, if you watch our, our video, I found some maps on, online mm-hmm. of people kind of recreating what it looks like. And you can see what they're trying to do with Custer's troops to mm-hmm. kind of encircle what they think is, is the, you know, the Native Americans down at the river. Yeah. But there's 7,000 Native Americans down there. Like you said, 2,000 warriors. Mm-hmm. They, they were so far outmanned and outgunned, they didn't have a chance. They didn't have a chance. So... Reno, I mean, this all happens in about two hours. Think about how quick this is happening. Reno says he can hear it happening. And people have speculated, was Reno a coward? Why didn't he go? Why didn't he send people out? People don't know. People think Reno might have thought this was a a suicide mission that Custer was doing anyway when he saw all these people. Why are we attacking when we should have been waiting for our reinforcements from the other Calvaries. Here we're doing this because Custer thought he had it in the bag or Custer just, who knows what Custer was thinking. But he gets on Last Stand Hill, which is the highest highest part of the land that you can get to right there. And you'll see the monument is there today. And he shoot they shoot all their horses. So that's one of the things we talk about too, is they're going to shoot all of their horses because not only are the American Indians trying to scare the horses away, and they're very successful at that, they they shoot them to use them as shields, yeah. and they call it breastworks because basically think of protecting your breast. You're gonna you're gonna use your horse as a as cover. aim yeah. as cover. You're gonna lay so it's protecting your breast basically. Plus, it, your horse has all your supplies, has all your extra ammunition. So they shoot all of their horses. They basically build themselves like a barricade in a circle but the american indians just overpower them yeah and and you had even said too that like in that that era that was a a known kind of last ditch effort you know kind of defensive tactic we don't think about that today because you know we 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 don't fight like that today but if you think about it i mean i talk about buffalo bill cody doing things like this custer has had 11 horses shot out from underneath him in the civil war that's why people thought like this is something with this guy. He's been, his horse has been killed 11 times and he hasn't. So it's not, I'm not saying horses are expendable, but it was something that was thought of as a last ditch effort. Right. And people don't know exactly how Custer was killed, but they do say the Buffalo calf woman was the person who knocks Custer from his horse. He has two bullet wounds when he is found one in the head and one in the chest and they don't know if they were before or after, which one killed him. They don't know if the bullet wound to the head is yeah. after. And, and, and Last Stand Hill, th- this this video is actually doing quite well, even better than our, our last mm-hmm. couple videos, which is surprising and pleasantly surprising. <laughs> but I think part of the reason is that we show so much of the area, right? So Last Stand Hill is the high point. There's all sorts of grave markers around there, including a grave marker for Custer, even though he's not as far as we know, buried there anymore. So those markers were put there. So the, the, there's been an evolution of the battlefield. At first they had little like obelisks and then people would just take them yeah. and then they would just replace them. And then now they have the markers. Now they have a gate around the markers. When I was a kid, you could walk around the last Dan Hill markers. Now there's a gate around the last Dan Hill markers. Custer's marker has black on it to kind of distinguish it from the other markers. There's more markers than actual men that were on last Dan Hill. So 
they believe there was only 40 men on last Hill. I think there's like 45 markers out there. So again, it's it's close enough. Yeah. People really believe that they were killed on the top of the hill where the monument stands today because they would they made their stand at the high ground. So where those markers are could be where they buried them. Now, I, I want to just touch on it because people always want to know what happened to Custer's body after. Was it mutilated? Yes, it was. So you have to think all of a sudden Reno hears no sound, no more gunfire. He knows that's it. He, he stays he stays where he's at until he's reinforced the next day and they're able to get away, him and his troops. They're able to fight off and stay right where they are. The American Indians will bury their warriors and start to move because they know something's coming. Yep. And believe me, this, this is going to be answered. But the American Indians, when they encounter the dead soldiers, their bodies are ransacked. Of course, they take all the, the gear that they can find. And they are scalped. And there are some mutilations done. And people believe it could be because if your body's mutilated, you're, you must walk the earth for the rest of your life. So, but no one knows for sure. But when the soldiers eventually do get to the bodies, which is about five days later, they do wrap them up in blankets, very shallowly bury them and cover them with rocks. And they believe that is where those markers are. Okay. And then about five years after that is when someone's like, oh, Custis should be at West Point. Yeah, because he graduated there. Because he graduated there. Yeah. And, and, and other people want their family's bodies too so some uh, other army officers come out there to retrieve those bodies and as you can think five years animals shallow graves shallow graves nothing much is things are scattered they find what they believe is a officer a lieutenant colonel jacket with the bones but they're not sure because again things have been who knows what the american indians kept or didn't keep or through and and so at the, the the officer just gets to the point. Grab those ones. That's Custer. Yeah. Grab these ones. That's send them to yeah. West Point. And so then they take all the bones and bury them at the very top and put the monument above it. Yeah. So there's no bones where those markers are today. They're buried at the monument, and in all likelihood, some of Custer's bones are still there. And who knows? It might be a little Custer and a little of some other peeps oh. with <laughs> in the grave at West Point, but. Uh, what is interesting, too, is I'd say in the last 20 years, they have put red markers for the American Indians that fell. That, was, the that was cool to see. And, and I, again, as, as the, the non-history nerd here, I appreciated them kind of it, it evolving, mm-hmm. you know, through that. Because you know they didn't do that when they first kind of created no. created the national park that was that, that's there. But now they have a, like an Indian, in a Native American memorial. Yes. Um with all sorts of really, really well done. And I did my best to kind of show it. We had like high noon sunlight, you know, (laughs) so it was difficult with glares and cameras and stuff, but it was really neat to see how they did that, the Indian Memorial. And you could see, you know, just up the hill was the monument, was Mm -hmm. Last Stand Hill. It was, it was pretty, it was very well done. It was neat. There's a lot of symbolism there. It's, you can see it has a little crack so you can see the monument of Last Stand Hill. It is a circle, so it's very much how um, the American Indian fought mm-hmm. in a circle. It has a silhouette of the American Indians and their horses, and the way, like I said, how they kind of hang around the necks of their horses, which makes it hard for people to aim at them. And it, it is a very beautiful. And it talks about Custer smoking a peace pie, promising never to kill a Cheyenne. And then, what is it, less than seven years later? And it, it, it says, if you do, your body will turn to dust. And he does. So it's just very, like, for foreboding. It has some great etchings of the chiefs. And like I said, uh, Sitting Bull is there. Crazy Horse is there. Crazy Horse will eventually surrender himself in Nebraska, where he will eventually be killed. He will be bayoneted by an army officer. And Sitting Bull will, he'll run away to Canada. But he will also eventually surrender himself, and then he will eventually be killed by the army. So this is the last great triumph of the American Indian. And like I said, although they will win this battle, they will ultimately lose the war. And they are still on their reservations today. 
And uh, I think what happens, you know, the Custer, this is a rallying point for America. This is a great way for people in media and newspaper to really paint the American Indian as a savage again and for them to, again for the army to go out there and to really regulate where the american indian can live and again start to break down their culture and send their children to westernized schools and try to erase a lot of their heritage and traditions and they're not that is unsuccessful thank goodness but what i do try to stress at the end of this video and i think it's important is there's no sides here both both sides fight valiantly to their deaths in a lot of ways both are fighting for something they ultimately believe in and when you think Custer is fighting because it's his job to keep the American Indians on these reservations he's part, he's part of the treaty he's also helping the crow and he feels like this is his duty to do the job to, to protect the, the, the Westerners, the people who are homesteading and Crazy Horse and Sydney Bull are fighting for their way of life. And so I look at it as there's no win. There's no winner here. This is a very much a culture clash of American history. And I, I look at both sides fighting valiantly to the end. Custer, this will go on to be kind of romanticized because Custer's wife, Elizabeth, goes on this kind of campaign That's right. to protect his image. Yeah, I remember you you mentioning that, which was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I can understand in that era why a wife might might do mm -hmm. that, right? It's kind of tied to the livelihood and, mm -hmm. and your place in society and, and all this stuff. So it was very interesting learning about this and actually being there. Mm -hmm just kind of had that feel right yeah. it was it was some national parks you can kind of get the feel for what happened back then and this absolutely was one of them and and actually i think we we had learned that like a week after we left they were doing they were getting ready to shut down yeah the visitor to, center the visitor center because mm -hmm. they're getting ready to overhaul it for mm -hmm. you know do it like a, a large large overhaul yes and so. if you go visit there is a national cemetery there that has nothing to do with the battle of little bighorn so when you see the national cemetery it's just people who have fought in uh, you know it's uh, veterans it's yeah. veterans who are buried there on the uh reservation but when you drive up you might be like oh are these the people from battle no that has nothing to do with the battle of little bighorn but i i just want to stress that I feel very proud of the American Indian in this regard because they did, they beat the bully, they beat Goliath. But I also feel bad for Goliath because they are fighting for something that they they don't know any better either. And so for me, it was just, as an, as an American and as a historian, it's someplace that I really think is such an important part of our history. It can't go away. We have to learn it and we have to learn all of it. I really appreciated the spirit tree that was there that had all the cloth tied on it. I know that the American Indians celebrate every year. They do ghost dances and they're out there, you know, still celebrating their ancestors and that moment. And I just think it's a very important to not forget it. Yeah. And, and, and largely too, because the national park is located on a native American reservation. So it was, it was neat. It was so neat for me because I have family ties history ties to montana we actually had a friend that, that lived didn't didn't live too far away and we felt bad not, sorry, not reaching courtney. out to, yeah sorry courtney <laughs> for for not reaching out we were we were very limited on time and because we drove six thousand miles over the course of two weeks mm -hmm. but it was an absolute blast and that is absolutely one of those places like you just have to make the effort to get out there and go it's not close to anything you, you have to make the effort, but it's 100% worth it because you just see these vast kind of rolling plains hills and way off in the distance, you can start seeing some bigger stuff, some of the bigger mountains in Montana and just driving through there is, it's a, it's a different part of the country. Mm -hmm. It's bigger and it feels bigger yeah. out there. It's powerful. It's very powerful. So I hope that you've gained a deeper understanding of the pivotal moment that forever altered the course of history. The Battle of Little Bighorn stands as a poignant reminder of the clash between cultures, the complexities of human conflict, and the resilience of those who fought to protect their way of life. 
So join us in the next episode. We'll continue to delve into the tapestry of the past and uncover the threads that connect us to these remarkable events and that have shaped our world that Jen and I love going out, walking in the footsteps and sharing that with you. If you enjoy this podcast, we have a bunch of other episodes to cover Western history and we encourage you to check those out. Follow us so you don't miss more episodes just like this. And as always, thank you for joining us and sharing the Talk With History podcast because we rely on you, our community, to grow. And we appreciate you all every day. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you.